So if you're just joining me for the first time, what I'm doing here is I'm just reading the um, English translation of the Quran. And uh, I have pinned the link already for guests to come up on stage. Um, we're trying to do the Quran in 30 sections or 30 juz. Uh, today, we're going to be going over the third juz. So we're continuing on with Surat al-Baqarah. And again, I, I just want to preface, I'm not a scholar. These are just my own personal reflections as I am reading the Quran. Uh, side by side with me, though, I do have pulled up uh, Tafsir al-Sadi in order to expunge on some of the um, some of the topics that are discussed in the Quran, particularly uh, if I have a, a keen interest in going in further so we can actually get some scholarly insights uh, on the topic that is being discussed. So I welcome all non-Muslims to come up over to the stage and uh, have a chat if they have a question about Islam. But once again, my main goal with these streams is really just to get through the juz. So I do thank you for your patience while you wait. Uh, as I get through the reading, that way that it can be of benefit and you can have a recording of it and listening to it maybe in the car or something like that. So uh, with that being said, um, obviously when you approach the Quran, you want to get ablution. So make sure that you've made wudu. And then uh, the next best thing to do is to seek refuge from the accursed shaitan. So we say, I would be lahim in a shaitan or rajim. And we say, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in order to have the best possible approach and the best intentions when approaching the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that way that he can open our minds and open our hearts to receiving this type of information uh, from his blessed bounty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so we left off at the beginning of the third juz, which is uh, ayah number 253. And this is in Surah Al-Baqarah or the second revelation of the Quran. Again, the Quran is not a book that is chronological. So you can pick it up and almost similar to like a Google index, you could pretty much go anywhere in the Quran if there's a topic that interests you, but we left off at 253. So let's just kick it right off. Those messengers, some of them we caused to exceed others among them were those to whom Allah spoke and he raised some of them in degree. And we gave Jesus, the son of Mary, clear proofs and we supported him with the pure spirit, which is angel uh, Jibril in uh, the Islamic eschatology. If Allah had willed, those generations succeeding them would not have fought each other after the clear proofs had come to them. But they differed and some of them believed and some of them disbelieved. And if Allah had willed, they would not have fought each other, but Allah does what he intends. So let's see what the tafsir has to say about this, um, because it is an interesting topic. Particularly, I want to note that uh, when Isa alayhi salam or Jesus is mentioned, uh, immediately is followed by son of Mary. So there's a clear-cut distinction. There's a clear-cut distinction of who he's the son of. Um, he, we, we as Muslims do not believe that Jesus is God incarnate. Uh, or that he's divine in any which way, but we love him, we respect him, we cherish him, uh, we just don't worship him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran immediately says, uh, Isa ibn Maryam, which is um, Jesus, the son of Mary. So here's what the tafsir says. Those messengers we favored, some above others, uh, there are some to whom Allah spoke directly and others he raised in rank. So uh, Sadi says, here Allah tells us that he favored some of the messengers over others and that he singled them out from among all people to receive his revelation, to be sent to the people, to call them to Allah. Then he favored some of them over others in terms of what he bestowed upon them of praiseworthy characteristics and righteous deeds and in terms of what they brought of benefit to people. Some of them Allah spoke to directly as in the case of Musa ibn Imran, who singled out uh, who, whom he singled out to speak to directly. Some of them he raised above others in status, such as our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in whom were combined all the qualities that were scattered amongst other prophets. Allah combined in him all the virtues by means of which he superseded the first and the last. And to Isa, son of Mary, we gave the clear sign. That pointed to his prophethood and confirmed that he was the slave of Allah, his messenger, his word that he bestowed upon Maryam, which is Mary, and a spirit created by him. And following that, his commentary is, and supported him with the pure spirit. That is with faith and certainty with which Allah supported him and gave him the strength to do what he commanded him to do. It was also said that uh, what is meant is that he supported him with Jibril, who stayed with him constantly. 
<clears throat> so we have an insight into Isa alayhi salam's life that he was constantly with uh, Jibreel alayhi salam, which is pretty amazing. It's a it's a really amazing insight. Uh, if Allah had so willed, those who came after them would not have fought one another after clear signs had come up. So because the signs, uh, because the signs should bring about unity in faith, but they disagreed amongst themselves, some believing and others disbelieving. These differences resulted in division and enmity and fighting. Yet despite that, if Allah had so willed, after they had these differences, they would not have fought. This indicates that the will of Allah always comes to pass and defeats all measures. Rather, measures uh, may only be of benefit if they are not contrary to the divine will. If the divine will is there, all measures aimed at achieving the opposite will be diminished. Hence, Allah says, but Allah does whatever he wills. Thus, his will always prevails and comes to pass. This and similar verses indicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always does what is dictated by his will and wisdom. Among the things he does, he does are those uh, that he has told us of himself or that of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has told us of such as rising above, descending, speaking, and other actions that he may or may not do. And there is a note here. Just as, as the believer is required to know about his Lord, he is also required to know about his messengers, plural, their essential characteristics and what is and is not appropriate for them. All of these qualities may be understood from the description that Allah has given of them in numerous verses for example, they are men, not women. They are townspeople, not desert dwellers. They are chosen and selected. Allah has instilled in them all praiseworthy characteristics because of which they are qualified to be chosen and selected. They are free of any faults that could undermine their mission as messengers, such as lying, treachery, concealing knowledge, and the faults of other, and other faults that would undermine their position. Any errors they make with regard to the message are not condoned, rather they are corrected, and Allah has chosen them to receive his revelation. Hence, we must believe in them and obey them. Anyone who does not believe in them is a disbeliever, and anyone who criticizes or reviles any of them becomes a disbeliever who has gone beyond the pale of Islam and may be subject to capital punishment. There is a great deal of evidence for what uh, has been mentioned above. Whoever ponders the Quran, the truth will become clear to him. And rightfully so, right? If these people were elect and chosen by Almighty God, then it is an act of disobedience to go against them. And um, there, is a, uh, there is a justified punishment for that. Because remember, going against them in opposition is not just, you know, standing up and saying that you no longer believe usually what these people would do is they would be in open opposition they would wage war they would threaten the lives of the messengers and so on and so forth so um, there is a, a great deal of uh, conversation around apostasy but the scholarship covers it very very well okay continuing on 254 oh you who have believed so this is talking about the people that have believed spend from that which we have provided for you before there comes a day in which there is no exchange or ransom, and no friendship, and no intercession. And the disbelievers, they are the wrongdoers. So obviously there's gonna be a day of account and people are gonna be trying to barter with one another in exchange for um, salvation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaffirms us the position that there's not gonna be any type of exchange. Uh, ayah number 255, which is a very, very famous uh, ayah, um, it is uh, an extremely powerful and uh, miraculous statement. So it reads in English, Allah, there is no deity except him, the ever-living, the self-sustaining. Neither drowsiness overtake him nor sleep. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission? He knows what is presently before them and what will be after them. And they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except for what he wills. His kursi extends over the heavens and the earth, and their preservation tires him not. And he is the most high, the most great. And I think it's worth looking at the uh, commentary of this. So uh, Asadiq says, this verse is the greatest, best, and most sublime verse in the Quran because of what it points to of important matters and divine attributes. Hence, there are many hadiths that recommend reciting it regularly at different times, morning and evening, 
when going to sleep and following the prescribed prayers. In it, Allah tells us about himself, that there is no God but he. That is, there is none deserving of worship except him, for he is the true God to whom all types of worship, obedience, and devotion should be directed. Because of his perfection, the perfection of his attributes, and his great blessings. And it is befitting that the human being should be a slave to his Lord, following his command and heeding his prohibitions. Everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is false, and worship of anything other than him is false. Because everything other than Allah is created, imperfect, under his control, and dependent on him in all ways. So it does not deserve to be worshipped in any way. Uh, the ever-living, the self-sustaining, and the all-sustaining. These two divine names inherently imply all the other divine names. The ever-living, Al-Hayy, is the one who has perfect life, which implies all attributes of his essence, such as hearing, sight, knowledge, power, and so on. The self-sustaining and all-sustaining, Al-Qayyum, is the one who is self-sustaining and whom others need to exist. This implies all the actions of the Lord of the Worlds, who does whatever he wills of raise, uh, rising above, descending, speaking, creating, granting provision, giving life and death, and all types of control. All that is included in the concept that he is self-sustaining and the sustainer of others. Hence, some of the scholars said that these two are the greatest names to which, if Allah is called upon by them, he will respond. And, he, and if he is asked by them, he will give. The perfect nature of his being ever living, self sustaining, and all sustaining means that neither slumber nor sleep overtake him. The word translated here as slumber implies drowsiness. To him belong all that is in the heavens and on the earth. That is, he is the sovereign, and everything other than him belongs to him. He is the creator, the provider, the controller, and everything other than him is created, provided for, and controlled. It does not possess. Uh, for itself or for anyone else the weight of an atom in the heavens or on the earth hence allah says who is there that can intercede with him except by his leave or by his permission that is no one can intercede with him without his permission all intercession belongs to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when he wants to show mercy to whomever he will amongst his slaves he gives permission to whomever he will to honor amongst his slaves to intercede for him the intercessor does not initiate intercession before permission is given. He knows what is uh, what was before them, that is, what is in the past of all things, and he will be after them, uh, and, and what will be after them, that is, what lies ahead in the future. His knowledge encompasses all details, past and future, apparent and hidden, seen and unseen. People who have no control over their affairs at all uh, people have no control over their affairs at all, and they do not have the slightest knowledge except that which he has taught them. Hence, he says, while they encompass nothing of his knowledge except what he wills. His kursi extends over the heavens and the earth. This is indication of his perfect might and all-encompassing power, as the kursi encompasses the heavens and the earth, despite their vastness and the greatness of what they contain. The kursi, or throne, however, is not the greatest of Allah's creation. Rather, there is something that is greater that is, uh, excuse me, the kursi, which is a seat, however, is not the greatest of Allah's creation. Rather, there is something that is greater than it, namely the throne, al-arsh, and that which no one knows except him. The greatness of these creations dazzles the mind and is beyond comprehension. It causes the mountains to crumble and cannot be grasped by even the most brilliant of human minds. So how about the greatness of their creator and initiator, who instilled in them many wonders and mysteries that point to his great wisdom, the one who keeps a firm hold on the heavens and the earth, lest they fall apart, without becoming tired or weary. Hence, he says, and the preservation of both does not weary him. That is, it is not burdensome from him, for him in the slightest. For he is the most high in and of himself above his throne. He is the most high in the sense that he is the subduer of all his creation and most high and the most high in status because of the perfection of his attributes, the most great. The might of tyrants appears insignificant when compared to his greatness and the status of powerful kings appears small when compared with his majesty. Glory be to the one who is possessed of 
uh, of great power and might over all things. So uh, furthermore, he concludes with this. This verse refers to the oneness of divinity, uh, which is Tawhid al uluhiya the oneness of the divine lordship, Tawhid al rububiya and the oneness of the divine names and attributes, Tawhid al asma wa sifat It also refers to his all-encompassing sovereignty and knowledge and to the greatness of his power, majesty, glory, might, and pride, and his exaltedness above all his creation. This verse on its own highlights belief in the names and attributes of Allah and implies all the beautiful names and sublime attributes of Allah. SubhanAllah. So um, a lot to unpack there, but quite simply put, this is the Lord that you're invoking. So when you are making dua, uh, when you're making dua, it is a, um, a, a an absolute blessing to be invoking this uh, entity as your Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So um, th this is the all-seeing, the all-powerful, the all-hearing, uh, and the one exalted and most high. All right, 256. There should be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. Again, there's no compulsion in Islam. It's perfectly, uh, everybody's on their own journey, and they can choose to conduct the research, do the reading, and make a choice by themselves. The right course has become distinct from the wrong. So whoever disbelieves in Tabut and believes in Allah has grasped, has grasped the most trustworthy handhold with no break in it. And Allah is hearing and knowing. Allah is the ally of those who believe. He brings them out of darkness into the light. And those who disbelieve their allies are Tabut. They take them out of the light into darkness. Those are the companions of the fire. They will abide eternally therein. Have you not considered the one who argues with Abraham about his Lord merely because Allah had given him kingship? When Abraham said, my Lord is the one who gives life and causes death. He said, I give life and cause death. Abraham said, indeed, Allah brings up the sun from the east. So bring it up from the west. So the disbeliever was overwhelmed by astonishment, and Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. So in this situation, you know, how it's kind of applicable to what we see in an everyday life is if somebody, if, if you see somebody that is uh, blessed in other ways, whether that be wealth, um, whether that be health, whether that be some type of status, right? Um, they can uh, gain arrogance and their ego can overwhelm them. In this particular instance, it, it references kingship. So there is a person that had some type of authority, but he refused to listen to uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So with that said, uh, moving on to 259, or consider such an example as the one who passed by a township which had fallen into ruin. He said, how will Allah bring this to life after its death? So Allah caused him to die for a hundred years. Then he revived him. He said, how long have you remained? He, the man said, I have remained a day or part of a day. He said, rather, you have remained 100 years. Look at your food and your drink. It has not changed with time. And look at your donkey and, he, and we will make you a sign for the people. And look at the bones of this donkey, how we raised them and then we covered them with flesh. And when it became clear to him, he said, I know that Allah is over all things competent. I just want to take a brief moment here. And um, we don't know who this man is, but we know that he was honored by being mentioned in the Quran. So obviously, um, he uh, was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us some type of an insight. And truly, like, if you're being patient and, and being good and waiting for the day of judgment, this is one really cool thing that you'll get to find out on the Day of Judgment of who this person actually was, right? So there's all these things that you can, all these kind of golden nuggets or just kind of tidbits that you can um, absorb from. And there's many stories in the Quran where they don't mention the name of the people, but they mention an event, right? A wondrous event or some type of key takeaway. So, you know, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be of the righteous on the Day of Judgment. Um, and I mean, so that way that we can find out who this man was that actually went through this and mention when Ibrahim uh, said, my Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Allah said, have you not believed? He said, yes, but I ask only that my heart may be satisfied. Allah said, take four birds and commit them to yourself. Then after slaughtering them, put uh, on each hill a portion of them, then call them. 
They will come flying to you in haste and know that Allah is exalted in might and wise. Okay, one key takeaway for me personally when I read something like this is even the prophets had hard days. Okay, even the prophets had hard days. I am Sam. I mean, Ibrahim, right? Uh, one of the greatest messengers. And he's asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hey, just my heart's feeling really heavy. Just give me some type of support today, right? So even these people that were so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you know, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam is considered a friend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So imagine um, if your iman is fluctuating up and down, it's okay. Just take a minute, uh, make some dua, you know, and uh, ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, uplift and, and strengthen your heart. Uh, so, uh, carrying on, the example of those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah is like a seed of grain, which grows seven spikes, and each spike is a hundred grains, and Allah multiplies his reward for whom he wills, and Allah is all-encompassing and all-knowing. And wallahi, I can attest to this personally, I'm sure you guys can attest to this as well, uh, every single time that I have donated fi sabirillah, my money has never depleted. And, and alhamdulillah for that. As a matter of fact, it's increased. And, um, you know, subhanAllah, this is uh, more evidence and more proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate uh, wh whomever he will into whichever capacity he will. But when it comes to charity, we all have a level playing field with that. And he tells us that it'll grow sevenfold and then even, um, even more on top of that with a hundred grains. Uh, those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah and then do not follow up of what they have spent with reminders of it and others or, or, or other injury will have their reward with their Lord and they will be there will be no fear concerning them nor will they grieve kind speech and forgiveness are better than charity followed by injury and Allah is free of need and forbearing aka if you're going to donate a particular amount it doesn't matter what it is let it be relevant to your situation but um, stay quiet about it don't go about saying like, oh, yeah, I just donated all this money and I did all this stuff. You don't have to do that. It's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that kind speech and forgiveness are better than charity followed by injury. So if you go and donate and then you say something that harms or injures somebody, um, it's, it's not a good thing. Rather, uh, kind speech and forgiveness are better. Oh, you who have believed. So referencing the people who have believed. Do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it. Uh or injury, uh, as does one who spends his wealth only to be seen by the people and does not believe in Allah and the last day. His example is, is like that of a large, smooth stone upon whom, uh, excuse me, upon which is dust and is hit by a downpour and leaves it bare. They are unable to keep anything of what they have earned, and Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. So there you have it. In the example of those who spend their wealth seeking means to the approval of Allah and assuring reward for themselves is like a garden on high ground, which is hit by a downpour. So it yields its fruits in double. And even if it is not hit by a downpour, then a drizzle is sufficient and a law of what you do is seen. Yeah, subhanAllah. Uh, right there and there, stay quiet, spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek his approval and your you, you will see the, you will reap exactly what you sow. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the fruits will be doubled. So you got to kind of till that ground, lay the landscape, do the work, right? Would one of you like to have a garden of palm trees and grapevines underneath which rivers flow in which he has from every fruit, but he is afflicted with old age and has weak, aka immature offspring, and it is hit by a whirlwind containing fire and is burned. Thus does Allah make clear to you uh, his verses that you might give thought. O you who have believed, spend from the good things which you have earned and from that which we have produced for you from the earth and do not aim towards the defective therefrom, spending from that while you would not take it yourself except with closed eyes and know that Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to me is saying here is if you're going to buy something for somebody else, let it be exactly of value or greater of what you would buy yourself. Meaning, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a situation where you had something quote unquote re-gifted. Okay, don't do that, please. 
just take the gift, accept it. And then when it comes time for you to issue a gift, uh, make your own, <laughs> make your own gift and let it be, let it be so um, in a, for the sake of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, remember the quality of that gift, okay? Uh, Satan threatens you with poverty and orders you to immorality, while Allah promises you forgiveness from him and bounty. And Allah is all-encompassing and knowing. He gives wisdom to whom he wills, and whoever has been given wisdom has certainty been given much good. And none will remember except those of understanding. And this is so true, you guys. I don't know if you guys uh, have know someone in your family, but I know someone in my family who's very, very, very cognizant of money. Meaning like if a, if a penny goes up or down, they're very cognizant of it. And they're always in fear of loss. And um, this is something that we can all work on, inshallah. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us immune to the threats of shaitan, especially in regards to poverty. And now poverty doesn't necessarily have to mean strictly with money, but rather it can be um, uh, being emotional, uh, having poverty with emotions and respect towards one another's, our neighbors, uh, so many different things, poverty in our characteristics, right? Um, so just know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you exactly what you're going to get, and you're not going to get a penny more or a penny less. So everything is either alhamdulillah wa shukrillah, uh, which is showing gratitude, or it's going to be uh, sabr, which is showing patience. And whatever you spend of expenditures or make of vows, indeed Allah knows of it. And for the wrongdoers, there are no helpers. So if you owe somebody money or if you've made a vow to pay somebody back, do it. Uh, if you disclose your charitable expenditures, they are good. But if you conceal them and give them to the poor, it is better for you. And he will remove from you some of your misdeeds thereby and a lot of what you do is fully aware now uh, this right here to me as a reflection is let's say if we're at a charity event then um, sometimes people raise their hands on what they want to donate right so like people yell out a particular money amount and you're disclosing what you're going to donate by saying yes you know i would like to do that amount but it's better for you to conceal it allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says meaning that even if the charity event is concluded you can still do things in in secret and um, give uh, uh, give with silence. But not upon you, O Muhammad, is responsibility for their guidance, but Allah guides whom he wills. And whatever good you believers spend is for yourselves, and you do not spend except seeking the face, which is the approval of Allah. And whatever you spend of good, it will be fully repaid to you, and you will not be wronged. So, in the Dawa scene, often people uh, will talk to us and they'll say, oh, solve this problem for me or give me this type of guidance or do this or do that. We're not the one that guides. It's just our responsibility to deliver the message. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that guides. And again, that's based off of following the positive characteristics, which he deems as righteousness. So uh, avoiding things like envy, avoiding, avoiding things uh, like jealousy, avoiding things like dishonesty, all these things will um, lead you towards the path of righteousness, having sincerity, uh, having faith, using reasoning, using logic, all these things will lead you towards um, righteousness and following naturally the characteristics of the prophets. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, open the door for you. Charity is for the poor who have been restricted for the cause of Allah, unable to move about in the land. An ignorant person would think themselves sufficient because of their restraint but you will know them by their characteristics, uh, which is but by their characteristic signs. They do not ask people persistently or at all, and whatever you spend of good, indeed Allah is all-knowing of it. Those who spend their wealth in Allah, uh, in Allah's way by night and by day, secretly and publicly, they will have their reward with their Lord, and no fear will be there concerning them, nor will they grieve. So once again, we have uh, yet another guarantee by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you're spending your reward, uh, with the spending the bounty that was given to you, then not only is he going to increase it for you in this world, uh, also in the next, but there's nothing for you to worry about or have any grievances. Those who consume interest cannot, uh, cannot stand on the day of resurrection except as one stands who is being beaten by Satan into insanity. That is because they say trade is just like interest. But Allah has permitted trade and has forbidden interest. So whoever has received an admonition from his Lord and desists may 
have what is past and his affairs rest with Allah. But whoever returns to dealing in interest or usury, those are the companions of the fire. They will abide therein eternally. So here's the deal. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to dealing with interest, it's a very, very in-depth topic. Um, I can take a look very briefly to see if there's uh, some additional insights that we can gain from the tafsir, inshallah. But um, truth be told, it definitely requires scholarly uh, input. So I know that sometimes it can be as sensitive as, you know, keeping money in the bank and that's accruing interest. Um, I know that credit cards are haram. So uh, interest in usury really has consumed this planet and destroyed so many people, so many lives. So it's no wonder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said uh, to completely stay away from it as best as we can. But naturally, even the Prophet Ali Sallallahu said that we would be hit by the dust of interest if even if we try to stay away from it as best as we can. So he doesn't have much commentary. Um, rather, this is what Asadi states. Those who consume usury, uh, actually, let me see here. Uh, yes, he actually, he does have some commentary. So it says here, Allah tells us the use of bad end and hardship that those who consume usury will face. They will not rise from their graves on the day of resurrection to stand, except like a madman who's being beaten by the shaitan. So they will rise from their graves confused and shaky as if they are drunk, expecting a severe punishment. That is because they thought and said, trade is like usury. Such a statement would only come from one who is very ignorant or one who ignores what he knows out of stubbornness. So Allah will requit them in an appropriate manner and they will become like insane people. It may be understood from the words, they will not stand on the day of resurrection except like a madman who is being beaten by the shaitan, that when they lost their minds in seeking to earn through usury, they became very foolish and unable to think properly. Their appearance and movements will be like those of insane people with a complete lack of coordination and loss of rational thinking. Allah says responding to them and explaining his great wisdom, but Allah has permitted trade because it serves the public interest and there is a great need for it. And because prohibiting it would cause great harm. This is the basis for permissibility of all ways of earning money unless there is a text to indicate that something is not permitted. And forbidden is usury because of what it entails of wrongdoing and evil consequences. Usury or riba is of two types. Riba nasi, uh, pay now or pay an increased amount later. And riba fadl, which involves trading two things of the same type, where one is greater in quantity than the other. Both are haram according to the Quran and Sunnah. And according to the consensus of the scholars in the case of riba nasi, those who permitted riba, uh, riba fadl held an odd view that is contrary to the abundant texts. Rather, usury is one of the major sins that may doom a person. Therefore, he who desists, that is, gives up what he is doing and is deterred from it because of the admonition that has come from his Lord, uh, that is the admonition reminder uh, and warning against dealing in usury. This admonition is a mercy from Allah towards those to whom it is addressed and serves to establish proof against them. Uh, they may keep their past gains that resulted from previous transactions in which he engaged before his admonition reaching him. He may keep them as a reward for accepting the advice. This verse indicates that the one who does not desist will be punished for both his earlier and later actions. His case is for Allah to judge as to whether to requit him, but those who return to it, that is to dealing in usury and who do not benefit from the admonition Rather, they persist in it, will be the inhabitant of the fire, will they will abide by it therein forever. The scholars, may Allah have mercy on them, differed concerning the texts that speak of punishment, where the apparent meaning suggests that those who commit major sins that are less serious than associating others with uh, Allah, which is shirk, the worst sin of all, will abide in hell forever. The best view is that which says that in these cases where Allah states that certain sins will doom a person to eternity in hell are applicable uh, provided there is no impediment, that is, tawheed or disbelief in the oneness of Allah. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a pretty serious condition right there, and I'm not going to delve too deep into it because um, I want to continue on with the literature so that we can benefit, inshallah. 
but um, he does conclude that Allah destroys usury. That is, he takes it away and takes away its blessing so that it becomes a source of problems and trouble and takes away blessing from the individual life, individual's life. If he spends from it, he will not be rewarded. Rather, it will bring him closer to hellfire, but will give increase for deeds of charity. That is, he will cause it to grow and will send down blessings upon the wealth from which the charity is given, and he will reward the giver. That is because of the requital befits the action. The one who deals in usury wrongs people and takes their wealth in an unlawful manner. So he is punished with loss of his wealth. The one who is good to people shows kindness to them in different ways. And his Lord is kinder than he is. So he treats him kindly and he is kind to his slaves. So there you have it, folks. If you're dealing with interest, which is haram money, there's no blessing in the money. If you have halal money that you've earned in a halal way and you give it out for charity, then subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase you um, from that charity that you give. Once again, stating that the, um, that the uh, benefits of giving charity and stuff like that do not go unacknowledged uh, because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, endless mercy. Okay. So carrying on here. Uh, 276, Allah destroys interests and give, it gives increase for uh, charities, and Allah does not like every sinning disbeliever. Indeed, those who believe and do righteous deeds and establish prayer and give zakat will have their reward with their Lord, and there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. So again, you have more um, conditions in order to get to that guarantee. O oh, you who have believed, fear a lot and give up what remains due to you of interest if you should be believers. So now that you know, give it up. Don't, don't follow it. You, you know and you can now be held accountable. And if you do not, then be informed of a war against you from Allah and his messenger. But if you repent, you may have your principle. Thus, you do no wrong, nor are you wrong. So subhanAllah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually um, threatening you. He's threatening you with a very severe threat. So if you are not going to give your ways up and you're informed, then you are effectively waging war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're waging war with your provider and there is no victory there. Okay. And if someone is in hardship, then let them be postponement until a time of ease. But if you give from your right as charity, then it's better for you if only you knew. So if somebody owes you something and you forgive them in, in Islam, it's better for you, right? It could be your ticket into Jannah, meaning especially if they're going through a hardship and they were just to say, hey, you know what? Can you delay my payments? Um, this is completely permissible. So uh, you, you're conducting a charity if you were to outright forgive them for what they owe you. But if even if you were to delay them, it's a particular act of charity, uh, which is amazing. Now, imagine trying to pull that off in a capitalistic system. There's not a chance. Um, you know, they just come pounding on your door and seizing your assets right away. So, and fear a day when you will be when you will be returned to Allah. Then every soul will be compensated for what it has earned, and they will not be wronged or treated unjustly. O oh, you who have believed, when you contract a debt for a specified term, write it down, and let a scribe write it between you in justice. And uh, let no scribe refuse to write uh, as Allah has taught him. So let him write and let the one who has the obligation or the debtor dictate. And let him fear Allah, his Lord, and not leave anything out of it. But if the one who has the obligation is of limited understanding or weak or unable to dictate himself, then let his guardian dictate injustice. SubhanAllah, here we have rules of contractual obligations. So if somebody's not of sound mind and body, if they're not able to think rationally for themselves, they need to have a guardian present. And likewise, there needs to be a scribe. And what's a modern day scribe is a notary. They take a look at all the things that gets stamped, right? There's a, a seal that gets put on the document in order for a contract to be valid. So like, for example, you have terms and conditions and contracts uh, with, you know, anything from like your employment to your house, to your car, all this other stuff. And they require notaries and look at, you know, subhanAllah, the, um, the process that Islam educates people on, on what to take, especially if somebody's not of sound in mind. So imagine how many contracts were signed, uh, in a capitalistic system where people were taken advantage of simply for the purposes of money and 
um, getting in debt. And bring to witness two witnesses from among your men. So there's witnessing parties, witnessing uh, of the signature. And if there are not two men available, then a man and, and two women from those whom you accept as witnesses. So that if one of them, i.e. the women, errs, then the other can remind her. And let not the witness refuse when they are called upon. And do not be too wary to write it. And whether it is small or large for its specified term, that is more just in the sight of a law and stronger as evidence and more likely to prevent a doubt between you, except when it is an immediate transaction which you conduct amongst yourself. So when it comes to like the marketplace and there's like a barter system and there's a, there's a, you know, a quick transaction, then certain times the contracts aren't going to, aren't going to be necessary. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. And in respect to the witnessing of the women, uh, needing more women than men in case if one woman should err, the idea is that women were not responsible with financial transactions back in the day. They had different obligations, different responsibilities. They weren't out in the field. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um, a condition for one or two, uh, uh, two women uh, uh, to one man in this particular witnessing, simply because women had different obligations. They didn't want to deal with the, with the stuff that the men dealt with. Forget about it. Okay. Uh, that is more just in the sight of a law and stronger is evidence and more likely to prevent doubt between you, except when it's an immediate transaction which you conduct amongst yourself. Um, for then there is no blame upon you if you do not write it and take witness when you con conclude a contract. Let no scribe be harmed or any witness. For if you do so, indeed, it is a grave disobedience in you and fear a law and a law teaches you. Uh, and Allah is knowing of all things. So imagine this situation. Don't harm the scribes, a.k.a. if they're a witness to something and you go try to do something wrong, what's the first thing you're going to try to do if you're going to try to cheat someone? You're going to try to eliminate the witnesses, right? And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us right here that um, yeah, obviously you can't do that. You can't com cause harm to people, but Allah is of all things knowing. So even if you were to try to cheat them and you were to succeed in this material world, um, in the hereafter, you're in big trouble. And if you're on a journey and cannot find a scribe, then a security deposit should be taken. And if one of you entrusts another, then let him who is entrusted discharge his trust faithfully and let him fear Allah, his Lord. And do not conceal testimony, for whoever conceals it, his heart is indeed sinful and Allah is knowing of what you do. So boom, there's another solution when it comes to transactions. Hey, I need to put down a security deposit. I'm on a journey right now. I'm going to get right back to you, but here you go. Okay. To Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. And it's funny, after all these transactional dealings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you that it's all his anyway. So who do you think you're really stealing from? You know, just take a moment and think about that for just a second. Okay. Whether you show what is within yourselves or conceal it, Allah will bring you to account for it. Then he will forgive whom he wills and punish whom he wills, and Allah is over all things competent. The messenger has believed in what was revealed to him from his Lord, and so have the believers. All of them have believed in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers, saying, We make no distinction between any of his messengers. And they say, We hear and we obey. We seek your forgiveness, our Lord, and to you is the final destination. And boom, there you have another powerful reminder of the chain of prophethood, how they all had a unified message. It was all monotheistic. They all submitted to one deity. And you have a, a fantastic dua. Um, and they say, we hear and we obey. We seek your forgiveness, our Lord, and to you is the final destination. Okay, so we seek forgiveness from the, from the Lord of the worlds. Allah does not change a soul except with what within, uh, except with that within its capacity. Excuse me. Allah does not charge a soul except with that within its capacity. It will have the consequence of what good it has earned, and it will bear the consequence of what evil it has earned. Our Lord, do not impose blame upon us if we have forgotten or erred. Another fantastic dua. Uh, so I mean to that, our Lord, and lay not upon us a burden like that, which you lay upon those before us. I mean, another fantastic dua. Our Lord, and burden us not with that which we have no ability to bear. I mean, 
Another fantastic dua. And pardon us and forgive us and have mercy upon us. Amin. You are our protector, so give us victory over the disbelieving people. Amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Okay. So if, here's the, the conclusion of Surah Al-Baqarah, and it's a fantastic ayah. You're not going to get burdened with something that you can't deal with, period. So if you see somebody that is going through a hardship, like let's say, for example, you have a friend, cousin, uh, or, or uh, extended family member who's had a passing away, um, that was destined for them. And their character is strong enough to deal with that type of trial strong enough to deal with that type of trial. Um, I have been uh, very blessed in my life that neither of my parents have passed away early. So Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them and, and elevate them and forgive them uh, and bless them. So um, uh, uh, I was probably not one of the people that uh, was strong enough to deal with the passing of an early parent, right? So uh, that was not one of my trials. Now, naturally I've had tons of other trials in my life um, but uh, alhamdulillah for the trials that I was given. And uh, I'm very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for uh, all the opportunities that he has given me um, and, and the patience that he has granted me. Okay, so that concludes Surah Al-Baqarah, the longest chapter in the Quran. So the next, and next up we have the third surah. We're still on the third juz, alhamdulillah. This is Surah Ali Imran, and, uh, which is the family of Imran. So we're doing really good, guys. Uh, let me just uh, see if I can grab us some of the um, context for uh, Surah Al-Imran. Okay, so uh, here's a, a little bit of um, of the uh, context that was that's given by Sadi. So the first uh, 80 odd verses of this surah have to do with debating with the Christians, highlighting the flaws in their arguments and calling them to enter the true religion, which is Islam. As the first part of Surah Al-Baqarah spoke of debating with the Jews as discussed previously. Okay, so now we have a little bit of history. So we have uh, the very first uh, portion of the surah, Alif Lam Mim. And again, we don't know what these letters mean. Only Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala knows uh, what, these, uh, what purpose these letters serve. But everything in the in the Quran does serve a purpose, and everything does have beauty and majesty because these are the words of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So uh, here goes Alif Lam Mim. Allah, there is no deity except Him, the ever living, the self sustaining. <clears throat> he has sent down upon you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming that was uh, that which was before it, and He revealed the Torah and the Gospel. Now the Gospel here is translated, but in, in the Arabic it says uh, Injil. So uh, it's not talking about the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. Um, it, it's talking about the gospel of Isa, Islam, which is the Injil. Before, as, a, uh, as guidance for the people, and he revealed the criterion. Indeed, those who disbelieve in the verses of Allah will have a severe punishment, and Allah is exalted in might, the owner of retribution. Indeed, from Allah, nothing is, is hidden in the earth nor in the heaven. It is he who forms you in the wombs, however he wills. There is no deity except him, the exalted in might and wise. And for the people that um, don't have children in their life, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you healthy children one day, inshallah. Uh, but um, I will tell you right now uh, that it is a process that even science and doctors have no clue about. They can try to look behind the veil as much as they want. But at the end of the day, it's all just guesswork. So uh, only he subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what's happening within the womb and uh, how we're being fashioned and formed. And that includes the um, that includes the insertion of the soul, right? Because being a human being, there is a, a composition to that. It's not just, you know, your soul is inserted while you're in the womb, along with the time of birth, the time of death, what's going to happen to you, all your risk, everything that has been given to you all incidents and, and all possibilities and, and so on, subhanAllah. So, uh, you know, doctors are not going to get anywhere near uh, that realm, obviously. Okay, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. It is he who has sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book. In it are verses that are precise. Uh, now, here's the beautiful thing about the word precise. The difference between something being accurate and something being precise is when something is accurate, it hits the target once. 
When something is precise, it continually hits the target over and over and over again with 100% accuracy. So it's an excellent choice of words there. Um, they are the foundation of the book and other unspecif uh, unspecific, meaning you have verses that are ambiguous and you have verses that are non-ambiguous. As for those in whose hearts is deviation from truth, they will follow that of it which is unspecific or ambiguous, seeking discord and seeking an interpretation suitable to them. And no one knows its true interpretation except the law. But those firm in knowledge say, we believe in it, all of it is from our Lord, and no one will be reminded except those of understanding. So here you have an example, right? What does Elif Lam mean? We do not know. It is ambiguous. However, we believe in it. We believe in it because it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And the ones that are choosing to deviate, so when you see these people that are attacking Islam, it's because they are choosing to ignore the verses that are precise, that are explicit, that there's no shakiness of in regards to foundation, creedal issues, anything to that extent. Rather, they go over towards the ambiguous and they argue and jibber jabber and chit chatter amongst each other, trying to create discordance within the community. So stand firm on your faith um, by using your reasoning faculties, which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging you. Uh, in Islam, we do not believe in blind faith. We do not believe in blind faith. Uh, who's, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, who say, our Lord, let not our heart deviate after you have guided us and grant us from yourself mercy. Indeed, you are the bestower. I mean, you know, wonderful dua. Our Lord, surely you will gather the people for a day about which there is no doubt. Indeed, Allah does not fail in his promise. Remember, his will is supreme and ultimate victory belongs to him and uh, his slaves. Indeed, those who disbelieve never will their wealth or their children avail them against Allah at all, and it is they who are fuel for the fire. Theirs is like the customs of the people of Pharaoh and those before them. They denied our signs, so Allah sees them for their sins, and Allah is severe in penalty. Say to those who disbelieve, you will be overcome and gathered together in hellfire, and wretched is the re is that resting place. Already there has been for you a sign in the two armies which met in combat at Bether, one fighting in the cause of Allah and another of disbelievers. They saw them to be twice their own number by their eyesight, but Allah supports uh, with victory whom he wills. But Allah supports with his victory whom he wills. Indeed, in that is a lesson for those of vision. So here's the deal. Uh, even though that you may think that you're you're up against odds, exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees is going to happen. Meaning that if you're on the side of righteousness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed for the sign of righteousness. So you want to be righteous with all of your dealings. All of your dealings. Uh, how it's worldly applicable. If you're out there trying to get a job somewhere and you're applying and all of a sudden you go through the interview process. Very simple example. If you don't get the job, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you from something. Point blank period. Right? That, that's it. Victory was given to somebody else who could have been a believer. Okay? Or victory was given to you in the sense that you were preserved from some type of downfall. Okay? Um, beautiful for the people is the love of that which they desire. Excuse me. Beautified for the people is the love of that which they desire, of women and sons, heap, heaped up sums of gold and silver, fine braided horses and cattle and tilled land. That is the enjoyment of the worldly life, but Allah has with him the best return, uh, which is Jannah. So let's just take a moment right here. <clears throat> the love of that which they desire, women and sons, okay? This is obviously talking to a male counterpart. So if, if you are a male... You desire women and sons. Naturally, if you're a female, you're going to desire men and you're going to desire children. So the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that is that is beautified for people is the desire for the opposite gender. Okay. Uh, and when he uses men as an example, especially their love for women. Okay. Next is sons. You want to have legacy. You want your lineage to continue. Right. That's why there was a big disagreement and you had the pagan systems which were burying their daughters because they just wanted sons, 
ridiculous. Heaped up sums of gold and silver, the next best thing. Okay, once I'm married, I want to have a bunch of money. I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. And, and how am I going to display that wealth with finely branded horses? Okay, so what do we got that's finely branded horses today with how much horsepower? Your BMWs, your Ferraris, your Mercedeses, your, you know, Escalades, all these things. These are finely branded horses. Why do you think that they wear their emblems on the outside? They talk about how much torque, how much horsepower. Look at what this vehicle can do. Look at the size of the rims because they're just finely. Look at the detail, the stitching on the leather and all this other stuff. They're just finely branded horses. Subhanallah. Okay. And cattle and tilled land, right? You want to have servants. You want to have servitude. You want to have a, a, a giant house. You want to have, uh, you know, uh, tons of land, a huge backyard. Right? Um, and again, this is the enjoyment of the worldly life, but Allah has with him the best, uh, the best return, which is Jannah. Say, shall I inform you of something better than that? Which is a question posed to the people that are, that, um, are disbelieving, right? So something better. You say to those people, shall I inform you something better of that? For those who fear Allah will be gardens in the presence of their Lord beneath which rivers flow, wherein they abide eternally in purified spouses and approval from Allah. And Allah is seeing all aware of his servants. Those who say, our Lord, indeed, we have believed. So forgive us our sins and protect us from the punishment of the fire. The patient, the true, the obedient, those who spend in the way of Allah and those who seek forgiveness before dawn. So here you have it. The early risers, you have people that are patient through trial. They're true in face of falsehood, okay? And they're obedient to the commandments of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained to follow or ordained to stay away from. Okay. Allah witnesses that there is no deity except him. And so do the angels and those of knowledge that he is maintaining creation in justice. There is no deity except him, the exalted in might, the wise. Indeed, the religion in indeed the religion in the sight of Allah is Islam, and those who were given the scripture did not differ except after knowledge had come to them, out of jealous animosity between themselves. And whoever disbelieves in the verses of Allah, then indeed Allah is swift in taking account. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us straight up the only religion accepted in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam, which is submission. We believe all the prophets were submitters. Okay, so if they argue with you, say, I have submitted myself to Allah in Islam, and so have those who follow me. And say to those who were given the scripture and to the unlearned, have you submitted yourself? And if they submit in Islam, they are rightly guided. But if they turn away, then upon you is only the duty of notification, and Allah is seeing of his servants. So Muhammad, السلام, he has no authority over people's hearts, period. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds him, hey, look, you take them to the water. It's up to them if they want to drink. And it's up to me if I want to change their hearts to get them to drink, period. So if they desire to drink, then uh, Allah in his infinite mercy is, is going to shift their hearts over to actually take the drink. If they desire to lie, cheat, deceive, be hypocritical in any which way, shape, or form, they're going to be staring at the water and they're going to be seeing nothing but problems in it. Nothing but problems. And this is where the Islamophobic comments come, come in from. is because they stare at that water. They know that it's the truth, but they go, oh, look at this little piece of dirt here. When it's not a piece of dirt, it's actually a, fluck, a, 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 a flicker of gold, but they see it as dirt. SubhanAllah. So, again, it's our job just to deliver the message just like the prophets, alayhi wasalam. Those who disbelieve in the signs of Allah and kill the prophets without right and kill those who order justice from among the people, give them tidings of a painful punishment. They are the ones whose deeds have become worthless in this world and the hereafter. And for them, will be there will be no helpers. Do you not consider, O Muhammad, وسلم, those who were given a portion of the scripture? They are invited to the scripture of Allah that it should arbitrate between them. Then a party of them turns away and they are refusing. That is because they say never will the fire touch, touch us except for a few numbered days. And because they were deluded in their religion by what they were inventing. So they, they were inventing things. They were inventing things. 
So how will it be when we assemble them for a day about which there is no doubt? Again, rhetorical question. We already know how it's going to be because we've received perpetual and continual warning. And each soul will be compensated in full for what it has earned. And there will be no, uh, and, and none of them will be wronged. And they will not be wronged. Say, O oh Allah, owner of sovereignty, you give sovereignty to whom you will, and you take sovereignty away from whom you will. You honor whom you will, and you humble whom you will. In your hand is all good. Indeed, you are over all things competent. You cause the night to enter into day, and you cause the day to enter into night. And you bring the living out of the dead, and you bring the dead out of the living. And you give provision to whom you will, without account, which is any limit or measure. Let not believers take disbelievers as allies, which is supporters or protectors, rather than believers. And whoever of you does not uh, does that has nothing, i.e. no association with Allah, except when taking precaution against them in prudence. And Allah warns you of himself, and to Allah is the final destination. Now, I just want to uh, pause here for just a moment. This doesn't mean that you can't have Christian friends. This doesn't mean that you can't have uh, friends of different faiths. Rather, when he, when um, the the word that's used here is awliya, which is you are they are like trusted companions, which you're sharing your secrets with, your deepest innermost secrets with, and you are uh, elevating them to statuses of like family and brotherhood and stuff like that. You can't do stuff like that. You just simply can't because you don't know what you don't know what kind of criteria they are using against themselves between truth and falsehood. And that's the issue. The issue is that they hold themselves accountable to a different standard than the Islamic standard. Now, of course, I know you guys are probably thinking like, well, what about all the bad Muslims and stuff like that? If they are upon Islam, if they are brothers in faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to deal with them in the same manner that he deals with any Christian or any Jew, period. Okay. If they're being hypocritical or whatnot, you need to use your better judgment. The idea is that you have to have a, a difference in standard of uh, of whom you're trusting and with what information. Okay. Uh, especially, you know, relevant to times of like secrecy and war and tribal uh, tribalism and all that other stuff. All that stuff plays, guys. So whether you conceal what is in your breasts or reveal it, Allah knows it. And he knows that which is in the heavens and that which is on earth. And Allah is over all things competent. The day every soul will find what is what it has done of good. Uh, excuse me. The day every soul will find what it has done of good present before it. And what it has done of evil, it will wish that between itself and the evil was a great distance. And Allah warns you of himself, and Allah is kind to his servants. So if you're if you're a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's going to be kind to you. If you're not a servant, well, figure it out. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you should love Allah, then follow me. So Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Again, it's just this perpetual amounts of mercy, perpetual amounts of forgiveness that the Quran is using. Say, obey Allah and the messenger, but if you turn away, then indeed Allah does not like the disbelievers. Indeed, Allah chose Adam and Noah and the family of Abraham and the family of Imran over the worlds. Descendants, some of them from others, and Allah is hearing and knowing. Mention, O Muhammad, وسلم, when the wife of Imran said, My Lord, indeed, I have pledged to you what is in my womb, consecrated for your service. So accept this from me. Indeed, you are the hearing, the knowing. But when she delivered her, she said, My Lord, I have delivered a female. And Allah ha was most knowing of what she delivered. And the male is not like the female. And I have named her Mary, and I seek refuge for her in you. And for her descendants from Satan, uh, and from her, and for her descendants from Satan, she expelled from the mercy of Allah. So she's seeking refuge uh, for Mary from Shaitan and her descendants. So her Lord accepted her with good acceptance and caused her to grow in a good manner and put her in the care of Zechariah. Every time Zechariah entered upon her in the prayer chamber, he found with her provision. He said, O oh Mary, from where is this coming to you? 
She says, it is from Allah. Indeed, Allah provides for whom he wills without account. At that, Zechariah called upon his Lord, saying, My Lord, grant me from yourself a good offspring. Indeed, you are the hearer of supplication. So the angels called him while he was standing in prayer in the chamber. Indeed, Allah gives you good tidings of John, confirming a word from Allah, who will be honorable, abstaining from women, and a prophet from among the righteous. He said, My Lord, how will I have a boy when I have reached old age and my wife is barren? He, the angel said, such is Allah, he does what he wills. He said, my Lord, make me, uh, make for me a sign. He said, your sign is that you will not be able to speak to the people for three days except by gesture. And remember your Lord much and exalt him with praise in the evening and in the morning. And mention when the angel said, O Mary, indeed Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the women of the worlds. O Mary, be devoutly obedient to your Lord and prostrate and bow with those who bow in prayer. That is from the news of the unseen, which we reveal to you, O Muhammad, and you were not with them when they cast their pens, as to which of them should be responsible for Mary, nor were you with them when they disputed. And mention when the angel said, O Mary, indeed Allah gives you good tidings of a word from him whose name will be the Messiah, Isa, the son of Mary, distinguished in this world and in the hereafter and among those brought near to Allah. So a couple reflections as this is going on. Uh, naturally, Maryam uh, 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 excuse me, Maryam uh, is, uh, is uh, elevated and honored to a high status. Not only is she honored by uh, bearing a prophet, but she, uh, a glimpse into her, into her character is witnessed through the Quran. She's righteous, she's devout, she's obedient, she is honorable, um, she is a cherished and, and, and a prized woman, right? These are all the, the statuses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes of uh, Mary. And uh, the other thing that comes to mind is uh, you have prophets that are in need again, and they're asking for offspring. So if you yourself are going through a trying time, uh, please, um, you know, make du'a and remember the story of Zechariah, right? Make du'a for, for yourself and, and really reflect on the Quran because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, granted him offspring. He will speak to the people. So this is verse 46. He will speak to the people in the cradle and in maturity and will be of the righteous. So there's one of the first miracles, which is different uh, from an Islamic perspective, is that he spoke in the cradle. She said, my Lord, how will I have a child when no man has touched me? We believe that uh, Mary is a virgin. The angel said, such is Allah. He creates what he wills. When he decrees a matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. And this is where we get the... Um, this is where we get the terminology of uh, that um, uh, he's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just said, kun fayakun, be and it is, and boom, Mary had a miraculous pregnancy and, and uh, Isa alayhi salam came out. Um, I did get a glance at the chat. So this is the Sahih International, Sahih International uh, translation. Okay, and he will touch him. He will touch him uh, writing and, uh, excuse me, and he will teach him writing and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. So Isa, Isa he was given knowledge of the Torah. He knew what was in the Torah and he was also given the Injil. Uh, remember, this gospel is not the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, Isa Islam didn't preach what Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John said. He, he preached his own gospel, which is the Injil. And make him a messenger to the children of Israel. Again, he was sent for Beni Asariah, who will say, Indeed, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, and in that I designed for you from, from clay that which is like the form of a bird. Then I breathe into it, and it becomes a bird by permission of Allah. So by God's permission, he is conducting these miracles. And I cure the blind from birth and the leper, and I give life to the dead by permission of Allah. And I inform you of what you eat and what you store in your houses. Indeed, and that is a sign for you if you are believers. So again, he keeps attributing things to uh, God. He is not uh, doing these things of his own uh, power. 
And I have come confirming that what was before me of the Torah and make lawful for you some of what uh, was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey me. Now here's the deal. A Torah, the, the, which is a set of rules, a set of laws. So uh, Isa alayhi salam confirmed some things and then he made lawful uh, uh, other things, some of what was forbidden for you, some of what was forbidden for you, okay? Indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him. That is the straight path. But when Jesus felt persistence in disbelief from, from them, he said, who are my supporters for the cause of Allah? The disciples said, we are your supporters for Allah. We have believed in Allah and testify that we are Muslims submitting to him. So Isa was preaching Islam and his supporters were all accepting Islam. Our Lord, we have believed in what you revealed and have followed the messenger. Uh, and this is in reference to Isa. So register us among the witnesses to truth. And they, the disbelievers, planned, but Allah planned, and Allah is the best of planners. Mention when Allah said, O oh Jesus, indeed, I will take you and raise you to myself and purify, which is to free you from those who disbelieve, and make you uh, and make those who follow you in submission to Allah alone superior to those who disbelieve until the day of resurrection. Then to me is your return, and I will judge between you concerning that in which you used to differ. So what do they differ? They differ, they differ on the lineage. They differ on the deity. They differ on the laws. They differ on all, all these things. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be the judge. And as for those who disbelieved, I will punish them with a severe punishment in this world and the hereafter. And they will have no helpers. But as for those who believed and did righteous deeds, he will give them in full their reward. And Allah does not like the wrongdoers. Another condition. This is what, what we recite to you, O Muhammad, of our verses and the precise and wise message, which is the Quran. Indeed, the example of Jesus, Isa, to Allah is like that of Adam. He created him from dust and he said to him, be, and he was. So if there's ever a discrepancy between, uh, you know, uh, Jesus being divine or not, if somebody believes that just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Jesus miraculously, alayhi uh, salam, through Mary, with uh, no male intervention, then Adam was created with no male and no female intervention. And uh, likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flexes his four methods of creation. You have the creation of Adam, which is from no male, no female. You have the creation of uh, Hawa or Eve, which is strictly from a male, right? She, uh, she was taken from Adam's rib. Then you have the creation of Isa and Islam, which is just strictly from female. And then you have uh, you and me, which is both male and female. And these are the four four categories which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers. Okay. Um, uh, carrying on. Uh, the truth is from your Lord, so do not be amongst the doubters. Then whoever argues with you about it after this knowledge has come to you, say, come, let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves, and then supplicate earnestly together and invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars. So if you're sincere, if you really think that you're upon truth and you want to take the challenge, then um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, go ahead and invoke, invoke my curse and see what's what. Indeed, this is the true narration and there is no deity except Allah. And indeed, Allah is the exalted in might, the wise. But if they turn away, then indeed Allah is knowing of the corruptors. Say, O people of the scripture, come to a word that is equitable between us and you, that we will not worship except Allah and not associate anything with him uh, and not take one another as lords instead of Allah. But if they turn away, then say, bear witness that we are Muslims submitting to him. So he's talking about submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's also talking about being equitable. And it's amazing. Anytime that you talk to anybody that is uh, that believes in God, they'll all tell you that there's one God, all of them, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? There is only one. But where the equity shifts is their understanding of God, right? And how it's different than Islam. O people of the scripture, why do you argue about Abraham while the Torah and the gospel were not revealed until after him? Then will you not reason? Here you are, those who have argued about that of which you have known uh, about Excuse me. Here you are, those who have argued about that of which you have some knowledge. 
But why do you argue about that of which you have no knowledge? And Allah knows while you do not. Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was one inclined towards truth, a Muslim submitting to Allah, and he was not of the polytheists. Indeed, the most worthy of Abraham among the people are those who followed him in submission to Allah and this prophet, and he's referencing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those who believe in his message, and Allah is the ally of the believers. A faction of the people of the scriptures wish they could mislead you, but they do not mislead except themselves, and they perceive it not. O people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the verses of Allah while you witness to their truth? O people of the scripture, why do you mix or confuse the truth with falsehood and conceal the truth while you know it? And a faction of the people of the scriptures say to each other, believe in that which was revealed to the believers at the beginning of the day and reject it uh, at its end that perhaps they will return or abandon their religion. And do not trust except those who follow your religion. Say indeed the true guidance is the guidance of Allah. Do you fear lest someone be given knowledge like you were given or that they would thereby argue with you before your Lord? Say indeed all bounty is at the hand of Allah. He grants it to whom he wills and Allah is all encompassing and wise. He asks for his mercy, or he selects for his mercy whom he wills, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. And among the people of the scripture is he who, if you entrust him with, the, with a great amount of wealth, he will return it to you. And among them is he who, if you entrust him with a single coin, he will not return it to you unless you are constantly standing over him, demanding it. That is because they say there is no blame upon us concerning the unlearned. And they speak untruth about Allah while they know it. But yes, whoever fulfills his commitment and fears Allah, then indeed Allah loves those who fear him. Indeed, those who exchange the covenant of Allah for their own oaths for uh, and their own oaths for a small price will have no share in the hereafter. And Allah will not speak to them nor look at them at, uh, at them on the day of resurrection, nor will he purify them and they will have a painful punishment. And again, it's just, it's a constantly recurring theme. If you're hiding, if you're lying, if you're concealing, if you're uh, hypocritical, you know, these are all the, the negative traits which are building upon your falsehood. And indeed, there is among them a party who alter the scripture with their tongues. So you may think it is from the scripture, but it is not from the scripture. And they say, this is from Allah, but it is not from Allah. And they speak untruth about Allah while they know. So knowingly, knowingly, they are altering the scripture. And again, this was mentioned in the previous chapter, but here it's reinforced once again. And this time it's talking about um, them uh, altering the scripture with their tongues. Uh, last time, I believe it was talking in regards to the scribes. So doing it with their hand. Woe to the people that change the scripture with their hand. So both hand and tongue. It is not for a human prophet that Allah should give him the scripture and judgment and prophethood. And then he would say to the people, be servants to me rather than to Allah. But instead he would say, be pious scholars of the Lord because of what you have taught of the scripture and because of what you have studied. So here you have it. None of the servants, none of them, because they knew exactly who they were talking to, would ever attribute themselves as being the creator or ever attribute themselves as being worthy of worship. Rather, they would point and tell you, use your, use your head be pious scholars of the Lord, meaning study the religion, as in study to your capacity uh, and take a look at the, the a scripture that was taught that was accurate, right? The accurate one of the time. And in our time, alhamdulillah, we have the Quran. Nor could he order you to take the angels and prophets as lords. Would he order you to disbelief after you had been Muslims? And recall, O people of scripture, when Allah took the covenant of the prophets saying, whatever I give you of the scripture and wisdom, and then there come to you a messenger confirming what is with you, you must believe in him and support him. Allah said, have you acknowledged and taken upon that my commitment? They said, we have acknowledged it. He said, then bear witness and I am, uh, I am with you among the witnesses. And whoever turned away after that, they were defiantly disobedient. 
So is, uh, so is it other than the religion of Allah they desire, while to him have submitted all those within the heavens and the earth, willingly or by compulsion, and to him they will be returned. And this is a very powerful statement because the people that are submitting willingly are going to get rewarded for it. And the people that are going to be unwilling are going to do it by compulsion, but it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late, which is they will be forced to bow on the day of judgment um, because to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will return. So take the time to really reflect while you're on this plane of existence so that way that you can uh, come to your own conclusions and submit willingly and get rewarded for it, inshallah. Say we have believed in Allah and in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants, Al-Asbat, and in, in what was given to Moses and Jesus and to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and we are Muslims submitting to him. And whoever desires other than Islam as religion, never will it be accepted from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will, will not accept uh, the, their way. Uh, and he, in the hereafter, will be among the losers. How shall Allah guide a people who disbelieved after their belief and had witnessed that the messenger is true and clear signs came to them? And Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. Those, their recompense will be uh, that upon them is the curse of Allah and the angels and the people all together, abiding eternally therein. The punishment will not be lightened for them, nor will they be reprieved. So here's the deal. If you are upon guidance, if you came to your conclusions, you use your reasoning faculties, but then you entered into a form of disbelief purely out of arrogance, then you're going to get punished for it. Um, and now he gives you an avenue out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you an avenue out. Here's the avenue out. Except for those who repent after that and correct themselves. So again, you have a warning, but then it's followed by an act of, of forgiveness and a, and a doorway. Uh, and repent and after that and correct themselves. For indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Uh, indeed, those who disbelieve, which is to reject the message after their belief and then increase in disbelief, meaning you're perpetually following those actions of disbelief, never will their claimed repentance be accepted. And they are the ones astray. Indeed, uh, uh, indeed, those who disbelieve and die while they are disbelievers will uh, never would the whole capacity of the earth in gold be accepted from one of them if he would seek to ransom himself with it. For those, there will be a painful punishment and they will have no helpers. So here's the deal. You could either repent, stop your ways, continue to believe and do the things to gain um, access to being righteous, or you can try to fake it and try to ransom yourself out. You know what I mean? It's just incredible. And then he tells you that your ransom is not going to be accepted. And your ransom is, and no joke, the weight of the world in gold, which guess what? You're never going to get there. You're never going to get there at all. All right, alhamdulillah, that is the conclusion of the third juz. I will end it with um, naturally giving salawat salam. So, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi Muhammad. Kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi wa sahabihi Ibrahim. Inna ka hamid al uh, Allahumma barak ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi Muhammad. Kama barak ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi wa sahabihi Ibrahim. Fil alameen, inna ka hamid al uh, Barakallahu feekum, everybody. Have a blessed uh, rest of the night, and I uh, will see you guys tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.